Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Region Six. This one we're going to be doing some updates on any of the projects that came here and want to share what's going on with them. Any roles that they might have available, opportunities for the community to weave in and support them at their project stage, anything they wanted to share about the progress that they've made. Um, so without any further ado, because there's a lot to talk about today, I will send it over to Nadine and you can give your update, everything that's going on, and then pass it off to them. Yes, thank you so much for the ranking. Yeah, we just started um, to plan our strategy here in Finca Sagrada. I landed here yesterday and um, yeah, we're supporting now here with two big projects. Is, well, two economies. One economy is the Finca Sagrada economy for itself, um, setting up a DAO and there you have the economy for the internal operations. And we would like to introduce uh, Vilcabamba um, economy, which is the next village here, connecting all the different farmers. And this is another um, big project. So we would like to set up these two economies, optimally um, at some point bridging them together and, um, and then in the utopian way, bridging it all to seeds, to the global seeds ecosystem. And then, then we would have um, a circular economy will connect it to the global seeds economy. It's, yeah, and we're just starting right now to um, figure out what are the roles that we need as our ultimate purpose and how um, what is our roadmap. And we know it's going to take some time. So yeah, every support is appreciated, of course. And um, thank you to, to this Region Civics Alliance, what we have done until now. And some other projects like Lala Gardens, they have figured out some aspects already and have some templates so we can use them pretty good here. And yeah, we would appreciate, of course, your um, wisdom when, when our documents are ready and our maps or whatever to get uh, some insights from you. Maybe we're missing some things and parts. So. Yeah, we are very, very looking forward. And me, myself, I'm super happy here right now. It's so beautiful. It's it's like a big kudos to Walter, what you have created here with the biodynamic farming. It's it's just an epic, epic farm or garden. It's It doesn't look like a producing farm. It looks like a heaven garden, but it is producing food at the same time. It's incredible. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. <laughs> Sorry, I had muted you, Walter. If you want to unmute yourself, because your response was probably beautiful. You're unmuted now. Uh, I said, I'd agree, but yeah. And well, like, there are over 10. One knows what they do and they support each other. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty lovely. Um, well, ask me in two weeks again, uh, my main picture, but it looks like a very beautiful picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I deem here to start some of the work, so we're very happy. Yeah. Awesome. Um, does anyone else want to share any updates for Finca Sagrada? Because there's a couple other people that are part of the project here before we move on to the next project. Because you guys have seven minutes to share and you've only been at it for like three. So I think you got about four more minutes or we can have a Q&A if anyone has any questions for anyone of the team of Finca Sagrada. I do have a question about Nadim and how your trip was and when when you got there. Thank you. Then let me first ask uh, answer the question in the chat is where is the project? The project is in Ecuador in next to a village called Vilcabamba. It's kind of a sacred um, village um, attracting um, like-minded people. So they are very open. There. The, tokenization or cryptocurrency or, or like supporting Pachamama and connecting to the nature and using technology as well. So having these two things, fertile soil 
or what we are trying to do. And I'm really looking forward for this. And yeah, my travel, it, uh, it was a long ride. Um, yeah, a couple of buses and over mountains and whatever. Um, yeah, but it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> Been there, done that, Nadine. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> But you get rewarded with silence, you know, yeah. you get rewarded with, with you, you only hear nature here. There is yeah. no machine running. There is nothing at all. Yeah. Like it's, it's so, so beautiful. It is uh, freeing the soul and is liberating really. really. Wow. <laughs> I want someone to elaborate, else I will, on the Kogi and what they set up there. This is where I'm spending most of my time right now. Fire here, burning since a couple of years. And um, yeah, this is this beautiful Maloka, this uh, kind of, um, yeah, indigenous kind of structure you build. And inside there, um, it, there is a fire burning all the time. And whenever you feel like cold or you feel like you need energy or whatever, you just go there, you charge up and yeah, you feel, you feel the energy. Um, you can play some sacred music and yeah, it's, it's part of the four elements here that are so present really. It's they're very close together. It's a very magical place. I, I do want to add something to that. Um, when we were there in September, the Kogi came, the Kobe Mamos, there were two of them, and they dedicated a portal to Mother Earth, and they said, this land is sacred, it can never be sold. Um, it was an astounding conversation, but it's led in, uh, to, to, to something that just happened. I got invited by uh, basically a, a billionaire that lives in Stockholm, who has a private island called Eskeret, and he's invited invited five mamos from Kogi to be there, 35 people to come <clears throat> and be with the mamos for the weekend of September 15th to the 19th. And yesterday I just got a, a notice that I'm allowed to invite one other person. So if there's anybody out there that feels like they want to be in Stockholm and be with five mamos, let me know because I can put in one name for one more invitation. Wow. An, an epic yeah. plug at the end of uh, such a cool project <laughs> happening in Finca Sagrada. I'm just, yeah, incredible. Nadim, really exciting stuff. Please keep sharing as it unfolds. Um, who would like to go next? Maybe... Anders, send it your way. Hello, hello. Excited to be with you all. Uh, I'm in Northern California, about uh, three hours from San Francisco. Did anyone else lose them or is it just me? It's muted. Am I back? Just, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's do that again. Uh, <laughs> can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, my name is Anders Gustafson. I'm the founder of the Heartland Collective. And uh, the Heartland Collective is uh, in Northern California. We're about three hours from San Francisco, an hour from Sacramento, an hour City, which is kind of a hot spot of this area. And uh, it's a 25 acre uh, lakefront um, spot. Uh, I bought it with my mother. It's a, um, we started it out. She, she really believed in what it is that we're all doing. And, um, and we were able to purchase the property together. And I've been the main, been the main steward here for seven and a half years. And it's been a wild ride. We've done a lot in the last seven and a half years. We've built, um, we built a deck, um, six outdoor cedar showers, um, uh, half a dozen um, retreat slash Airbnb um, yoga um, uh, glamping decks. Uh, we have about fifteen glamping tents and 
We've got um, a two acre garden and um, a big um, Akiva. We got a, like a 150 person fire pit that we can all sit around and, uh, and just enjoy song and connection through. And uh, the mission of this place is to help other people get on purpose. Uh, we really want to activate purpose in everybody because we feel that there's a frequent that exists when people are on purpose that lights other people up. And we really want to be with people that are lit up. And so we, uh, our place is inspired by Burning Man. There's got lots and lots of art here, lots of big art and everything. Most things are made from recycled materials or upcycled materials, but it doesn't look uh, mishmash, hippity dippity or anything like that. Really nice and we've had over 400 people come through here to volunteer to help build this place uh, people have invested over 12,000 hours in co-creating this place with us but it's been a lot of work and now we're still we're I say I'm seven and a half in seven and a half years into it and almost at what I consider the 1.0 and so um, in these last few months before the end of the year we're hoping to finish up our 1.0 and that's really a big part of doing Heartland 1.0 is coming together with uh, Regen Civics Alliance and creating our DAO together and actually. And what we've also done is um, we've modeled our whole entire property in, um, in 3D. We've 3D modeled our whole entire property. And so we're, next week, we're going to be bringing it into the metaverse. And what we realized was that the experience that we have, us together on this call and other people that wa are wanting to get involved in opportunities like this are extremely privileged in many different ways. And many other people in the world don't know that yeah. permaculture exists. They don't know how we can live together, co-create together. They may or may not know how to access their purpose. They may or may not know that these things are possible. So in order to leverage what it is that we're doing in real life, our method is to duplicate a virtual twin and to actually um, sell our land in virtual worlds um, through uh, and also combine the virtual ownership of our land into actual project ownership. You know, our plan is also to never ever sell our land and multiple different places into multiple different uh, places of the world where we, uh, we currently have land in Costa Rica and that'll be Heartland 2.0 or Heartland 2. Um, and uh, we're in process um, of activating a new, um, um, a, a new part-time. Our model essentially offers the opportunity for four different types of members. One member type are just the visitors, the visitors that come in for either retreats that we offer or they come in for um, personal retreats, um, they get activated by the art, they get activated by everything, everything that we do here, and it's held in a private membership association. So that offers us the opportunity to feed them from our farm and to um, offer them various other services that wouldn't be available to us in the public sector. And uh, the next level membership are the people that are supporting this venture as allies. Allies are essentially either volunteers that come in and offer trade for their time to get a, um, an equitable share of what it is that we're doing and a dividend in the profits that the project earns. But what we're also creating is a really unique allyship of looking for all the different types of people that have all the very, very specialized um, skills to assist us to create this place to be one of the heavens on earth. And so they'll be able to buy in um, and buy into one of our land-based virtual um, NFTs or also partake in a, in a, in a, in a much broader um, NFT campaign that we have, which I'm not going to go too far into right now. Other than that, we're creating a new type of symbology that is designed to offer hope and connection to humanity. And the way that we're doing it is first through the virtual world. Um, but that's a little bit of a tangent, but that's integrated into our larger vision. And so, um, so our allies might be marketers, our allies might be um, you know, designers, they might be permaculturalists, they might be yoga teachers, they might be 
whatever, whatever it is, whatever it is, us bring more life into this co-creation that we're creating. Um, it functions a little bit like a timeshare in in return for their purchase of, um, in, in return for their fractionalized purchase of our project, they get to share time here. Um, depending upon how much they buy in, that's how much time they get to share here. Um, and then the uh, the next level member is a uh, is more of a co owner. Uh, we're permitting this to be an eight unit retreat center. We're in the process. In two thousand twenty four, we'll be building our permanent dwellings. Uh, we're not one hundred percent sure which route we're going to go for our permanent dwellings, but we'll be collectively deciding that as a um, as a collective. And um, and then those people will also have the opportunity to have access to this as a timeshare, but a much longer timeshare. Um, and those people will have access to be here for a month out of the year. And then um, it's also for them a long-term investment where when I believe that in some type of way, a way societal collapse is going to happen. And so the project is being created while everything is cool, while everything is fun, while everything is like, pretty chill compared to what I think um, will happen in the future. So right now it's a lot of fun to build this together. Uh, but those people that invest the, the bigger amount of funds to, um, to co-own this place, they will know that when that happens, whether it's in five years, 10 years, 20 years, or a hundred years for their kids, they have a place. They have a place in a, pl in a place at a place that has food, that has water, that has community, that has everything that, you know, a little small teeny village of 50 people would need to have in order, in order for that to be a place that can help the rest of humanity, wherever those people are at, um, to thrive. And so, um, and then the, the fourth level membership are um, the roles that we currently have um, based on the size of project we currently have right now, where the main function of it is a retreat center. And it is in, in a center where we offer various different services and various different uh, tools for visitors to activate. Um, and so uh, the roles of manager, and we have a project manager and a volunteer manager um, a project director, um, and then a project elder that's on site. And, um, and outside of that, um, the people that come in are more on a temporary basis that are part of that third level membership. And, uh, and we're in the process right now of just activating our PMA, activating our 508 C1A so that we can really be 100% uh, in the private and through this region alliance, we're able to really figure out how to integrate with all of the other projects that are here and how to make our tokens um, somehow, some way, you know, communicate and be able to be tradable with everybody else. And so I'm really excited about all that. Really excited where we're at and happy to be here. Whoa, epic flow download, Anders. Um... But yeah, I mean, exactly. I think you described what the Alliance is approaching in a very beautiful, perfect way of for building the alternative civilizations that, you know, we need if we're going through collapse or that we just want because they're more fulfilling and more enlivening anyway. So let's just do that because we can. So, so eloquently put, brother. that was beautiful. Does anyone have any questions for Anders or Heartland Collective before we go to the next? Well then, I do. I just real quick, Anders, and if you could uh, send me your uh, email address in the chat, I'd like to come by there and, uh, this fall. Just just check it out, you know. For sure, welcome. Okay. Sure. Oof. love it, brother. Um. Yeah, I'm really excited for that digital twin and being able to take that other places too. That's super cool. Um, because yeah, being able to have that experience without having the privilege or even the environmental damage of, you know, taking an airplane to fly to somewhere to experience it, they can go and see what it looks like to, you know, walk through a food forest to pick your lunch and then dance at the fire that night or whatever it is that's going on, right? Um, yeah. 
So to keep flowing today, I want to send it to Nico. And Nico, so great to have you here. And we've all we've talked about what happened a couple of weeks ago to you. So I'd love to have a little update of how you're doing, where you're at, and anything you want to share about the project. If you'd like to, if not, that's great too. I do, I do. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you. Um, for those who don't know, I was involved in a pretty bad car accident a few weeks ago, so I'm still recovering. Um, I, you know, the project has definitely taken a small pause because uh, both Roxy and I were in the car accident, and, um, you know, it'll take a few months for us to recover, and we decided to take things, you know, slow and take the time. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm about to finish um, the the village OS master plan that I was talking to you guys about. Um, I think I'm a few days uh, away from like finally having that giant mirror board. Um, and so I, I, I think we will, even though the project might need to take a pause, for a few months, um, we will share this thing uh, as is. So every so mostly people in the community and in the village building movement can start giving feedback and checking it in. And so we'll do a soft launch of that uh, so it can start be put out there to, to share with all of you and, and for all of you to take you know, anything that we have done in there. And then as per the project itself, um, because of the accident, because of like a variety of reasons, um, I, I will need to remain in Spain for like a certain amount of time. And, and so we don't know when we will be able to, to move forward to the next phase of the project, which was signing contract with the land owner and everything else. And I would say, um, there is a chance that the project will need to be postponed even by a year or two. Uh, so we don't know yet. Um, as of now, it's a little bit on like a, TBD, we need to sit down, we need to assess, we need to, we need to check if we have the, the team and the means to, to kick it off. Um, and, and if not, we'll just like postpone it by, by some time, but we will still want to just put it out there and start activating it. And like for Latira to become a, a project in the minds of people that can start like, you know, subscribing, pre-signing, uh, showing interest. And whenever we can launch, we will launch. And hopefully we won't need to, uh, hopefully we'll be able to to move forward with the with the landowner and, and with the project assets and not need to change too many things. Um, but yeah, right now it's a little bit of a, of a TBD. Um, but yeah, I would say expect um, soon. Um, I, will, I will send a link soon. Um, Barbara Lima is... Uh, publishing a new magazine around village building that I think you will all be incredibly excited about. And they're launching their first um, issue in like, I think a few weeks and, and we will have La Tierra feature there. And I think that's gonna be our like official launch. So um, I'll send more info as soon as it's ready. And and I hope that all of you can, you know, the other day I was realizing that the mirror board is gigantic <laughs> it's like it takes a long while to go through all the details so i'm now doing like a downsized version for like whoever doesn't want to spend like three hours in there um but i do hope that you know some of you at least have some time to to sit down with it and give us as much feedback as you can and so we keep polishing and, and iterating um also um with rebuild we're celebrating um our largest physical gathering to date called Gathering of the Tribes um, that is all around village building and we will do it in Lisbon and this is happening in about 10 days um, and so um, I don't know if any of you are, are coming but um, it will have about 100 and something uh, village builders and regenerators gathering in one place and so if there is anything that you know you want us to discuss in there or like, like we might be able to take out of it just let me know um i didn't know i was coming until very recently now with all the plans change i will be attending so happy to to take any of the you know rick if you want us to to present the reading service alliance or like any sort of whatever the uh and that's all i have for you
Ooh, um, two things I want to plug in here and facilitate a role. One, I want to invite a new idea that, uh, Nico, you showed up here with that master plan, which is an incredible you know, artifact that I think a lot of the projects want to get to and will take some time to get to. So you you had showed up to this you know, alliance kind of wanting to really run fast. So I find it kind of interesting now that you're slowing down to the same pace as everyone else. <laughs> So you say you're stopped, but I think you're kind of on path and we're just kind of moving at the same pace now. Um, I'm really happy that you're recovering well. Uh, the other one is announcing region civics at Gathering of Tribes. I can't imagine a better place to kind of go public and actually start talking about what we're up to. Um, and I was sharing with a couple layer one projects, trying to find the right one for home. I think we have found it. So I'll share more about that as those conversations unfold and there's discussions having on Discord if you want to be part of that. But then we can announce that at Gathering of Tribes too. So I think that'd be really nice to kind of talk about, you know, where we're building the token idea and start gaining, you know, interest in getting funding for what we're doing here. Um, absolutely. So awesome stuff, brother, in so many ways. Um, does anyone have any questions, thoughts, anything from Nico? Steven, I see your hand up. I'll send it your way. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Is there going to be any video made of the gathering of tribes? I'd, I'd love to see that if there is. Um, I would need to ask Victor, which has been um, mostly stored in the event. I doubt it. I think we've had this discussion on, on how online to be. Uh, presence and and being very present um but i will ask there might be some some sessions recorded and and in any case we are already in conversations for uh the next online rebuild that will happen at the beginning of next year uh and like the first one we made last last time we had like about 750 attendees and 140 talks and i would expect that this year will double or triple that and and we'll have a lot of amazing content that that will be recorded fully and that you'll be able to access and uh so if if we don't for gathering of the tribes uh be sure that in a few months we'll have uh, a much larger amount of content around village building and and of course i'll i'll reach out so we can have a few sessions for region civics and and a few things in there to introduce the project and, and have some Maybe even some like design sessions with people. Uh, we want to make it very practical and very like not so much like unidirectional talks, but a lot of like design thinking and masterminding around practical things. So, well, the other question I had was <clears throat> Hamdan. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Nadim Hamdan is uh, in Finca Sagrada in part to help Susan and Walter create a first basic business plan. And I don't know if you're willing to share your business plan with us or if it's electronically or digitally able to be shared. But if it is, it would be useful for us to look at it to uh, make progress on our, on our own master plan. Uh, 100%. As I was sharing in previous sessions, well, we have, we, we've spent a year of work with like a lot of people and and about two hundred and forty thousand dollars on developing this whole thing and it will all be creative commons and it'll be put out there for any of you to get inspired and even to just like use it and just copy parts of it just like just use use it um and the idea is that you know everything that we have done can be can be used if it's useful for you and and we think that also um will be you know, he said, use whatever is useful here. I also want to keep working to find ways to take all this knowledge and start turning it into kind of like design sessions where we can we can design ways in which people can, you know, who are building a village can come and design parts of their village um, with the design framing uh, to achieve something similar to what we have done. And, and within that also, if especially now that we'll need probably to slow down this a little bit and that I'll, I'll we'll be taking things a little easier, I would say um, I think we will also be offering some sort of like consultancy if any of you need a little, little bit of help to just do any of what we have done. Uh, we can also provide that and we can talk about what that means. But um, yeah, I think the, the goal is that, you know, we can all have a similar um a similar 
beautiful thing and I don't know if I can share my screen but I can yeah I can just show you for like a split second how it looks um but basically you have done these gigantic mirror board with like there is like seven of this where you can just dive in into the entire project and all the ways in which you can interact with it and the different villages and we've worked on like you know the architectural style thing that is happening in each one of the different uh parts that we're designing uh how are we approaching um like you know all the maps we've designed a lot of renders of the village um we've designed also like how are we interacting with the locals with the environment with all the different ways in which we're regenerating and and thinking about things uh thinking about the business in the land so it's like a lot here um so yeah definitely we can we can help and you can use any of this and i hope it, it i hope it helps i really hope it helps thank you brother yeah. this is so incredible <laughs> thank you yeah, for what it's worth, I'd be one of those people who want that three-hour journey. So <laughs> you're incredible stuff, Nico. Okay, we're going to keep flowing. Uh, I'm going to send it over to Charlie. Um, we can't hear you yet. There we go. That should work. Hi. Yep. How you doing? Um, in terms of updates from us at Salt Cross in England, um, we've spent we've probably spent the last couple of months really just building our team and getting an understanding of where we want to go. Our terrain is is pretty tricky in terms of convincing the, the the partners that will come on the ground to come into this kind of sphere. So we've got a very old landowner, um, almost a thousand years old, uh, in terms of direct lineage to those pieces of land and their wealth in in created in London um, they're the master developer they're the ones to convince and they've got a strong um, ethos at the moment of trying to be seen as uh, community developers as people that are to be trusted with um, with the legacy of local communities and had fairly bad publicity in the last few years with some of the developments they've been doing so we're trying to find the right way in and we're being very careful about that relationship because we want to make sure we'll only get one initial chance we've already I've already been working with them in a professional um, capacity in terms of stewardship, but in a traditional way as what the Garden Village Trust will will be operating like going forwards and, and it being recognizable. At the moment, we don't feel at all comfortable talking about this in terms of DAOs and, and digital governance and other things. So we're trying to figure out ways in which to get to that point. Um, and the, the, the way we're thinking at the moment is an event later this year in November uh, with some people that we know who are well-respected, um, trusted within the sector, who can bring us all to the table on, uh, without it being um, a, a direct focus on, on the Garden Village Trust itself, but on how do we do digital governments within, within communities, what DAOs have to offer, and to start the conversation that way, and then later add in, and there's a test case, um, because there'll be more than Grosvenor in the room. So we're trying to navigate that, and I've been talking to people about it. Um, our team is is growing. So the team that I started this journey with in terms of listening to these um, events uh, are the people from Open Systems Lab. They do a project called WikiHouse and PlanX and some other things. Um, they've been great. And so I've been join, joining them inside the People's Land Bank, which is what I've found is to be the only entity that's trying to do uh, land-based DAO stuff in the UK um, around regeneration and they've got a 49 person slack that we've been engaging in which is mostly planners urbanists regenerative designers some other things so that's been a good place to to, to situate this um, and then i've been gaining some legal support from someone who is the only person i found out that set up a blockchain-based community benefit society in the form of the um, odin society so that's quite exciting because we're really keen to use uk models uh, and to try and focus the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, to uh, adapt to these kind of projects. So we want to be able to make sure that other community land trusts in the country who often use the Community Benefit Society can operate using the clauses we create for the twinning of a DAO and, and an existing Community Benefit Society alongside other trading bodies that will come under the, under the trust. 
And then we've been gaining uh, support on development finance because it's a tricky one. It's a £658 million pound project. So understanding allocate to the landowners how to understand what we want to do which is to do a nft bond for all homeowners and to and to try and blend that into the treasury for what will cover the annual costs for this trust alongside a service charge so we know that we need to raise around five million pounds for an endowment which we think is entirely possible through an NFT, nft bond attached to each of the houses but we've got a lot of work to do to make that a more encompassing economic approach um and then we've been gaining some organizational support from Cooperative Futures in the UK are an advisory body and uh, Co-ops UK, who are another advisory body, sort of the trade body for cooperatives. And I'll be meeting them later this week. Um, we've got a tokenomics brief, which I'm hoping to speak to Reiki about late, later this week. We've got professional costings for various bits. Um, and uh, the bits we're really struggling about is, is the money at this point. So getting our heads around that, I think, will open up a conversation for us. I'm happy to talk talk through anything else that anyone wants to know about the project, but that's my update of where we are at the moment. Thanks for uh, for these sessions. I've, I've been listening to them avidly and sat in the background, but often it's quite late after a day's work, so I just listen or listen to the recordings. Yeah, no worries. I understand that time zones is really the the deglobalizing mechanism, right? It's kind of hard to be on the same tune. Anyway. Um, I have a question and that's around the NFT bonds. And if that's essentially, if you can explain it to me like I'm five, why that's really awesome for a community to do. So I got the inspiration from this, from a, a project that's already ongoing in Leeds in uh, the North of England, uh, where it's a thousand home um, trust, although they don't call themselves a community land trust, they're a community interest company. Um, where each of the homeowners of that site are going to have to pay a three and a half thousand pound bond on each of their homes. We can point to, and I know the developers quite well for that project, so I could gain their help from it. Um, that will go to owning the community interest company, which owns another company under it, which owns all the infrastructure. So broadband, uh, all of the gas, all the electrics, all of the um, energy generation technologies. Um, and they've managed to make the case for resilience by saying, we as a developer won't be able to upgrade our community uh, unless we leave a surplus making model behind once we leave. And so they've managed to make the case for this uh, bond in a traditional sense against each of the homes. We want to be able to point at that and then just replicate it um, through these different processes. So whether or not we we do so for that process is, is not really the problem initially is whether or not we can replicate what they're doing up in the north of England on this site and has been done in different ways on other sites across the country but this one being directly focused on the effects of climate disaster for this developer and that they're saying we will not succeed as a company if we don't leave these kinds of uh, resilience tech uh, techniques that's what we want to really focus on in, in convincing everyone else involved in this project that this is worth doing for the for ongoing annual treasury that's all I've got for now and I'm sure I'll have more later but that's the where I'm getting this from at the moment yeah I love it uh just for framing the piece I always saw you playing was really that that traditional institutional lens piece that we have to crack that code in order for your project to really succeed so this is one of the diverse ways we need to be exploring why these tools are better for you know humanity because we have all these different lenses that we have to like you know tease out so i absolutely love you know the, the project that you're holding on to right now and being able to support that um anyway that's my piece steven i got a hand up if anyone else has anything for chat. yeah yeah just real i had two questions one of them you just answered about the nft bond the other one is where is your project located in england uh, it's in oxfordshire um just to the northeast uh, northwest of oxford 20 minutes outside it'll have a park and ride uh co like coach park and ride uh into oxford city and then has access to london which is an hour commute from there so it's um fairly close to, it's a it's struggles with the issues of commuter problems with with, with being close-ish to London in transport terms. Ooh, and close. Uh, I think Stephen's putting together another map to 
gallivant around the globe visiting all these projects. That'd be fun. Uh, any other thoughts or questions for Charlie? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for the update, Charlie, and look forward to talking to you later this week. Thanks. Um, we're going to send it over to Stephen and Will. And then Alexandra, and then Robert. I don't know if you guys are trying to talk, but you are currently muted. Oh, we lost them. Never mind. So we're going to skip them, and we're going to go to Alexander. Alexandra. I don't have I don't have a project. I'm just a butterfly on the wall for to tell and trying to see what the projects are up to. So. Oh, that's right. I thought you were representing one right now. <laughs> yeah, do tell. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, then we're going to Robert. Hey guys, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have uh, a few updates, some logistically and. Uh, um, at the moment, Roberto and Laura, they are uh, traveling through Europe and they're attending uh, a mastermind session for a week at the traditional dream factory in Portugal. And that's about writing and going through a village uh, builder's guidebook. So basically, we did lose touch a little bit with what we are all doing here but not totally of course because we tried to keep up with it and uh, so many energies going on um i'm going to meet up with them on the 12th and we'll be there for the gathering of tribes uh, which is a rebuild event for four days it has some burning and vibes but we are going to do a lot of connecting groundwork there for future events and uh, collaborating um on the practical side uh, last summer, I've been there for three months at a location in Italy. We've been uh, renovating the place, uh, making all the buildings energy neutral, solar panels, uh, hemp isolation, stuff like that. So it was a bit messy, but it was pretty cool to be there and uh, also organized with Jillian being there for six weeks. Um, lots of stuff was going on there. We are connecting to local networks because a lot of people are really getting the sense that we can organize things in a regenerative way and we are offering our services to sort of guide them through the process. What uh, might be the next best steps because we're also learning. So that's one thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, for now, uh, we'll probably re-engage in a week or three when we have gone through three different events coming weeks. Uh, there is a connectathon that's been organized by Eco Civilization and Kodu Group on the 22nd on the Equinox. And there's something in between that will be organized where we will participate called a group called Voyages. And they are connected to parties that actually built regenerative villages um, in a time span from six to eight weeks, like pop-up villages, very exciting. So uh, yeah, lots of energies there. And I think that would be enough for the update so far and uh, appreciate all your great work. Yeah, awesome. Can't wait to have them. Um, wait back in. I'm just looking to see if there's any other project stewards here to share, which there's not. So my update right now then will be this bled over when we originally thought about doing this incubator is meant to be, you know, just three months. So we've gone on now almost four. Um, and it was meant to go through the winter season where projects had a lot of downtime. And here we are, we went through summer and <laughs> almost into fall. <laughs> so we kind of ran into the obvious things we knew we'd run into that people are getting overwhelmed come summer and fall. And anyway, so the first season was about learning really what the season needed to encompass. So I think we've kind of detailed that now. So I'm calling that kind of season zero, what we just had gone through. And a lot of projects, I think, kind of feel that way, where they still feel like, all right, we have to get our bearings and start from the foundations. Yes, we just touched on all the pieces that we kind of need to have in our mind in order to start making each piece. 
but now I think we've the the general feeling I'm getting from a lot of projects is we still have to kind of go from the bottom then and redesign our project guides, contributor guides, you know, what's our legal structure and still go through that process. Um, also, what's important to note here is kind of the meta, you know, economic cycles we're in is a bear cycle, meaning there's not a lot of money looking for places to go right now. And it's actually kind of being a little bit more pulled back into dollars. Meaning, I don't know if it's actually the best time anyway, as far as the macro cycle is concerned to go out there and start raising funds. So I think we actually are in a nice space here where we still can stay in this kind of winter season, so to speak, where we're doing the deep design of our projects. We can continue having these dialogues, we're sharing updates, and we are going back through the process of designing our projects with the intention that we're just getting to that ready point where we're ready to pull the trigger, announce what we're doing and start selling tokens at whatever pace it you know takes us to get there. But if we do get there, then we just hold off on that until the market conditions are right. And then also partnering with some other organizations within Web3 and otherwise, so that when we do release it, we're releasing it in concert with them. And you know it's having the, the effect that we know this thing can have if we release it appropriately, right? Um, so this is me trying to reset expectations. When we got started here, it was going to be this three month thing, and then we'd be selling tokens, and you know we're off. Now I'm saying actually there's a lot more to consider. A lot of projects just aren't feeling ready anyway. Why don't we just consolidate, move together, make sure we're doing this effectively, continue to learn from each other, etc. Um, so I wanted to share that perspective with all of you, um, get some quick feedback if anyone feels that, yes, this is appropriate sensing or no, you know. <laughs> so I'd kind of like to hear from a few of the project stewards that just shared, you know, how this resonates with where they're at. Yep, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Anders. Hey, so I, I like where you're going with this. And I also think that it's important to, uh, you know, the thir we, we brought 13 projects into this initially with the initial um, expectations that you talked about before. And, um, and now, you know, it's, it, as things are unfolding, these 13 projects are going, you know, like they're moving at different paces to get to where we, where we want to go. So I think that something to potentially consider um, would be that, once again, I think that we need to clarify at which point does a project need to be at in order to be part of this next stage and have various different things lined up. Because um, as much as I love all the 13 projects that are involved or 12 projects, whatever we have, if certain projects are go, are not actually going to be able to go through the process that we want to be, be able to go through in the time limit that this time that this a process should take, then it might actually not be in service to the rest of the projects to have that project as part of this collective. If there are other projects that are further ahead that could move forward in at the pace that we are going to move forward in. So there's like a lot of just like open questions and considerations and things for us as a collective to think about that I don't have any of the answers to, but I'm just putting that like on the, on the table. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. And I feel like it's at least once a week, some project is like, oh man, I want to join this and we're at this stage. So yeah, it would be great to let in a few more projects, I think, and maybe even keep it fluid again with the understanding that we're going to pick 13 when we actually, you know, hit that go live point. If we even need to do that, maybe that's, you know, uh, a limitation we didn't even need to set. So, um, my thing was just trying to maintain some structure to these calls so they didn't get overwhelming, but they didn't. And so we've been able to have kind of a nice sphere and a group moving at a similar pace. So I do like that, you know, open question for any project if this is right. Um, but I also know a big part of that was that it fell into summer and fall, which was really busy for a lot of projects. And we knew we weren't going to have the time. So we're already coming back around to almost being in winter again. So I think some of those projects all are going to have more time. But either way, I would like there to be a tight group that's going to go through the real season one, which I actually see happening in maybe a month or so from now. So that's kind of what I was thinking is we would give some time for the you know fall season right now to finish out the people schedules to open up a little bit more getting closer to winter and then we dive back in and make sure we're ready. 
but I'm saying also from the meta perspective, this works because the market really isn't as you know hot as we probably want it to be to be able to raise what we can if we timed it right. Um, so that's what I'm kind of alluding to now. So we don't know when that moment's going to be, but my suggestion is we just keep moving forward at a, whatever pace is right for us, um, knowing that we want to be ready as as quick as it takes us, but then we time it when we actually announce what we're doing here and ask people to start investing. Um, but what does it take? I think that's a really good, maybe I can offer that summary. Uh, it's the really basic stuff of if someone wants to join your project, what does that mean for them? So whether they're going to contribute money, they need to know the legal structure, you know, where that money is going, who's making decisions, et cetera, right? All the questions that any investor is going to ask you, we need to have answers for all of those, right? And then the same thing for people who are going to give their time. So if someone's going to show up to your project and contribute in a role, like you need to have all the answers for them. How do they actually get there? How are decisions made? How are they going to get compensated and meet their needs, et cetera? Um, so that's the two big questions that every project needs to answer before we go out there and say, hey, come give us your time and money. <laughs> you know, So we can't ask for time and money unless we know how to handle it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where projects need to be. So that's what the whole incubator was about, the game guide, having that map that shows your whole structure, what's the legal structure, et cetera. It was all around answering those you know, basic questions of people are going to contribute. What does that actually mean? Um, I see some hands up, so I will send it over to Walter and then back to Anders. Uh, Reiki, I, I do concur with you about the, the fundraising until the crypto market starts doing something. I don't think people are feeling they have a lot of extra money like they do sometimes when, you know, when Bitcoin's worth a lot of money. And But the main thing for me all along has been um, working out this new way to uh, organize a community and I'm excited. It's interesting to hear how other communities are doing it. Some, some are way along. Um, and for us, uh, September is very important because we will be trying to uh, put some uh, uh, legal structures together, you know, the, the bylaws and all that kind of stuff. And um, we are in Ecuador, so some things just take a lot longer than we hope. Um, we've been trying to buy this property next door. It was going to be two months, but this that was about three months ago. And now I've found out it's going to take another four months. Uh, but in the meantime, we can get everything uh, lined up and we can um, soon we'll be able to start more officially um, inviting people to what we're doing as, as we get more stabilized, um, know better what we're offering. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was parroting back as I was getting that same perspective from a lot of projects that there was something that was slowing them down <laughs> and that we're kind of just in this more of a deep phase, which I think is important. I think also we kind of had that drive to just kind of act and do rather than really consider how we act. But anyway, um, Anders. Yeah, I think it has to do with uh, getting our product all have to come to that uh, the pre-launch state at the same time. It's quite unrealistic that we're all going to be like all ready at the same time. But if we have a definition of what it means to be ready, then we could officially put that project in the pre-launch stage. And then upon X amount of projects reaching that pre-launch state, let go. And then we can, you know, start start a campaign together. Um, but during that pre-launch time, I think that the, the our alliance can keep marketing that project and get email addresses for them. Potential, like uh, potential, um, uh, you know, come in and maybe during that pre-launch stage, tokens are cheaper. You know, so it's an opportunity for people if they re if those people are really into this particular project, then they could, you know, get in at a cheaper, you know, buy-in than what they will during the actual launch. And once X amount of projects have reached that pre-launch stage, that opens the gates for us to then do our collective campaign. Um, I think that's a brilliant synthesis. So if I compare it back, what I understood and kind of put it into my mental model here, um, we have this pre-launch state that if you're ready to answer both of those questions, what happens if someone wants to offer their time or money, any form of capital, right, that we're going through, um, if you have answers to them, then you're ready to launch. 
maybe we have seven in them when the market just feels right and we just go with seven because we're ready to go those seven are ready great you know so that's really when we actually pull the trigger maybe it's the 13 slots are filled and that's the trigger pull or the market just says it's ready and we just decide to go so we have that ability so then we're just filling that out um, that's great and then we can open it up to having more projects so if any project can follow along this journey and as they get ready if they meet all of our conditions um, that would be also the objective conditions that we first outlined before projects were even considered. They have to have those met as well. So if any new projects are thinking of joining, we still have those metrics on our knowledge base of what we're actually looking for. So if those are met and you can answer both of those questions, then we can have you on that launch. And then maybe it turns out that we launch with 40 projects and we just feel like we can handle it. Like, So I, I like that idea that we can open that up. Um, was that me getting it appropriately? Yep. Yeah. Um, the second thing that we could do, and this is just an idea, and maybe this isn't legal depending on where you're at, but you could be selling those pre-tokens before you figured out you're legal, as long as you're really clear that these tokens are basically a donation. If you're wanting to take that risk, maybe you're going to get them at one-tenth the price. Maybe we're thinking about selling them at, but as long as you're really clear this is a donation to the cause, you're going to get a token, which may or may not represent equity in the future. Who knows? Um, that might be okay, or whatever language you have to use. And then we can start, you know, saying people who are really diehard fans of your project or they're willing to take that risk, um, maybe they can start contributing capital. Um, but I know that you need to have a pretty strong disclaimer letting people know that, hey, like this is basically a donation because um, we haven't figured out our legal and our structure yet. Um, if you're not wanting to take that risk, then maybe don't start raising capital right now. But either way, then the DAO or whatever one you use could work for that. And then it's as simple as, and this is how Haifa did it, someone wants to put in cash, they said, yep, I sent, you know, 10,000 in Bitcoin to this Bitcoin address. I want, you know, X number of tokens for that. In this case, it's a donation. And then the DAO votes on it. And they're like, yep, we saw those Bitcoin. I got in that address. Cool. Thank you for your donation. We're going to give you some tokens to reflect that donation. And then that's basically what you're doing with your DAO is you're recording that. And maybe it's a donation of you know Bitcoin or maybe it's a donation of their time. And they showed up to the project and started helping you. So your projects could start doing that right now. I actually highly recommend that, whether they're using a DAO or an Excel sheet that you're tracking who's contributing to your project right now. Um, so I think that could already happen today. I don't think we need the launch point. The launch point is more about accepting in capital marketing and this and doing things that if we did it inappropriately, the SEC and other regulatory agencies are going to come get mad at us. So that's where I'm saying we need to have 13 projects that have their legal structure, they're ready to answer those questions, et cetera, before we start you know, openly marketing this. That's what I'm saying is kind of that launch point that's more clarity for people. Um, but yeah, I mean, the DAOs can be launched, you know, months ago. It doesn't matter. We can get that going right away. Um, is that answering your question? Am I on part here? I want to send it back to you, Anders, to see if that weaved everything in. Yeah, it's all good. Sweet. Then does anyone have any thoughts? Questions, ways of altering that, concerns about what was said, or anything they want to add to the potential way of moving forward here. I'm going to stand here awkwardly and tell someone we, we co-created effort here, guys and girls. I use guys as a non-gendered term. Well, maybe, maybe you don't want to flow into it right now, but you already announced something for next session. So that might um, be a teaser. Yeah. Sure, I'll talk just two minutes on it. Um, and maybe, yeah, okay. So the idea was, there's so many ways of coming about this. What we just tried to do over these last 13 episodes, incredibly complex. Um, it's very difficult. <laughs> there's a lot, you know, a lot of moving pieces going on. So how do we simplify this? And I think I'm frozen right now. So let me stop talking for a second. Just a bit. We can hear you back. OK. Um,
So the place we have is kind of the incubator. It also is a game board. So the person who's been stewarding the land here for the last three decades, they used to do massive games, like a thousand person capture the flag games across the lake, for example, or the at the end of the harvest season, some fruit had gone bad. So they played like pickup football games where the audience was throwing tomatoes and other fruits at the guy who had the ball and they're just having fun and stuff like that. So they used to do huge games here and they're wanting to do games. And the guy who's steward this land, he's kind of like a game designer. He's been thinking of all these games. So he'd been thinking up for a while, this idea of cooperative monopoly. You know, the original landowner's game is what it's called. The original monopoly game was one version of playing the landowner's game, but I digress another time. Um, so the cooperative monopoly was basically how do we build different types of economic systems and play a game doing it and et cetera, et cetera. Very similar to our line of thinking here. Um, I think that was a beautiful synthesis because we've been talking about games and playing games for so long, but not necessarily fully bringing them into actually it being a game. So that's something that we were prototyping here in October and we're planning on launching like next year's the games is kind of like the Olympics for regenerative village building. So for example, you get teams of you know five or seven people, however big it is, and they go to each square and each square represents a physical place on the village project. So maybe it's an earthship building site, maybe it's the food forest, maybe it's the cafe where you're cooking food, maybe it's a forest where you're wild harvesting food or whatever, like each part of your village is a square on the board. And then each square has a square master. So it's kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, right? So the square master just designs some type of quest or something for their square. So they get to be really creative. Um, and then the square master is representing some role that they have in the village. This is how we're plugging it in with what we're doing here. So you might have a village role who's the permaculturist. Great. So then they're on the gardening square where they're doing their food forest or whatever it is. And he's teaching a little bit about food forest, but maybe it's like, you know, there's a quest where you got a companion plant five plants and you're going to get ranked and given a bunch of coins based on how well you achieve this. And the square master is obviously rating you in whatever way he wants to rate you. But then halfway through, you know, you roll a die and something happens and you got to figure that thing out or whatever. You get to just create a game and you got a 30 minute time slot for it. So then teams are running around kind of playing this cooperative game, like building the village, like at the earthship building site, you're like actually pounding tires, you know, and you know, maybe you have to pound as many tires as you can in 10 minutes and you guys earn coins based on however many you pounded or whatever. Right. So the idea is, is that we're building, you're using games to actually build the village and teach the skills that are required for all the roles to do village building. Because it's actually the reason why Olympics came together in the first place. The Olympics were just a fun way to train for combat. They wanted their societies to be combat ready. So they made all of these games to get them combat ready. This is where horse races and dog races came from too, to train the war dogs and train the cavalry. Like <laughs> they just made games to do these things that society needed to fight their existential risk, which was warfare. Well, today our existential risk isn't warfare, it's coordination challenges and <laughs> relationship challenges and emotional challenges. There's so much more. So like, okay, well, what did the Olympics look like for today's challenges in today's world. Well, it looks like you being in a team, you know, you're having to coordinate with other people, you're having these really complex, you know, multi-dimensional challenges to solve, not, you know, how long can you throw a spear or something like that, right? Not downgrading that, you know, physical, you know, challenges is fun and great too. So that was like the original spark. And it was like, okay, this is really awesome. And it pairs well with the incubator that we had been working on and I had talked about a little bit where let's say the projects, any one of the projects here, you're successful in raising your crowd pooling. And then 150 people are like, yep, we wanna be part of that project. You raise the 10 million you're raising or whatever. You've got all the resources and capital and 150 people like, yes, we wanna do that. Okay, now what? So <laughs> that's where we wanted to come in with these physical incubators where they can show up to the incubator and then they go on this three month facilitated journey to really understand what's going on here. So real quick breakdown of that, it follows the rite of passage kind of process. The first state being separation, separating from capitalism, the old stories we're leaving behind, et cetera. Second stage being in that liminal stage where we get to co-create. So it's the process we're creating here. The outcome is gonna be unique with every group that does this because the second stage is where they kind of co-feel into it together what it wants to be. And then the third stage is them actually materializing that, integrating it. So this is where they actually build the DAO, start their minimal viable economy, et cetera. And then this culminates with that group of 150 or however many it is putting on a games. 
So they become the square masters, the game master, et cetera. So they're running the game to teach all the skills they had just learned over the three months for their role, right? So this is kind of like their test, but it's fun. And this is where you bring in all the you know, energy from the outside world. The game is open for the public. So this is also where we're interfacing with you know, sharing the regenerative village, teaching all these you know, concepts, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like, I think you guys are getting. Um, so that's what we're putting on here at the, the incubator campus is we're launching, we're planning on doing the games already in October to kind of dry run it and test it. Because again, they've been working on this for a while. And then planning on doing the actual games from next summer. So that means that if any one of our projects here are ready to do a crowd pooling before then, that would also be a deadline. Because if you could crowd pool before then, then you can be one of the projects that are you know, actually meeting up here. We can only do one, but we don't know how to pick one if multiple projects want to choose us. With the idea that this, you know, we're templating this game structure, the incubator structure. So that any one of our 13 projects becomes an incubator itself, or however many projects. The idea is we probably need you know, a thousand of these incubators approaching it a different way across the globe. And that's exactly what we'd like to co-create with all the other projects is we become incubators. We're putting on games for our community within our you know, cultural context, et cetera. Um, so that was me trying to, I thought it would take me an hour to describe that. I did it in like seven minutes. Did I do well? Does that make sense? Is that a, yeah. Whatever thoughts, feedback, questions you guys have. Yeah, Walt, do you want to go? Otherwise, I can reflect on it. Walter? Me? I, I didn't have my hand up. Okay, uh, you unmuted. Yeah, thanks, Reiki. That's a lot. And I, I really uh, love the idea of what we have been past uh, six to eight months that we're now connecting it or you're connecting it with the community there in a physical place. It's really a, a very nice and sweet uh, touch to it. And uh, yeah, it sounds really intriguing. Uh, the Olympics for regenerative villages or developments. That's uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy that you guys, I'm sure you had a lot of fun sort of brainstorming about this together. It's, it's been awesome. I mean, it's been just same with all of us. I mean, every single person on this call and part of Region Civics is just bringing such an aligned piece that's like, that's the perfect spot for this. Awesome. So yeah, it just keeps yeah. them that way. So thank you for weaving it in, Robert, because this was, you know, your connection. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I, uh, maybe someone else feels like uh, responding, but uh, yeah, great, great stuff. Any other thoughts, questions? Last piece that I will add to this then is um, we're having a Region Civics campus here. So if anyone wants to be part of the coordinating team for Region Civics, we've got housing here. There's about 10 cabins that um, could currently be habitable up to about another 20. If we do a little bit of work, it wouldn't take that much. Um, then we have three locations with 30 to 50 acres. So we're looking at one being kind of an agro village growing a lot of food. So this is like maybe one hectare per family. They're growing a bunch of food for the whole community. But one where we're doing like a solar punk city vibe and it's um, zoned for business and the like anyway. So this is then we're going to sell to refi companies um, in the Web3 space for them to have a physical campus at you know, basically summer camp. And it's 20 minutes from Asheville Airport. So it's the regional airport for North Carolina. It's right close to that. It's five minutes to downtown. It's got cooperatives. But it's this lake that's surrounded by forest and 350. It's just gorgeous. And then the communities next to it are all like, you know, eco communities. So they built them in a way that there's a lot of green, et cetera. So the guy who's been stewarding this for the last, you know, four decades has been on the same journey as us, but he's just been, you know, building it in a physical space and dreaming up the stuff that we've been working on in the digital space. So when we met, he's like, great, you've got all the pieces I, you know, wished would happen, but, you know, I've been building it here. So it's been an awesome marriage there. Um, so anyway, this campus exists for us um, to be able to use, to incubate out of, to be able to, you know, invite core people to that we meet that are like, looking at living in Eastern you know, US, if they are great, they can connect here and potentially stay at this campus. With the, of course, the idea that a lot of our projects duplicate the same thing, that we've got these you know, refi campuses at each one of our projects that 
people can flow between them, share knowledge and create the new world out of, right? I wanted to awesome. leave more space for more reflections or feedback or any thoughts that anyone has. Robert, thank you for that prompt. Or Robert, yeah, yeah. Back too, yeah. Yeah, sure. And I, I'm certainly planning to come over in uh, spring, the beginning of spring next year. Well, we need to pull together the team to do the summer game. So I've been connecting with a lot of people who are already in this region before I started connecting out. So this is me, my, my first announcement, connecting out anyway. Um, so if you want to be part of running the games for summer, you know, reach out to me because um, I've got to put together that team. Yeah, great. And just as an addition for some people who might not know that Asheville is a very well-known area in town uh, where it is in North Carolina. Charles Eisenstein used to live there, as I understand, a couple of years. So th this, this change maker vibes, they're, they're just hanging around there. This was a hot spot for intentional communities for a long time, for eco villages, and why it's one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. It certainly is in the continental US. Um, it's high enough altitude and it's got its own bioregion that when you look at a lot of the climate targets of the areas that are going to be heavily affected, whether it's hurricanes or droughts or fires and all these things, this region seems to just be safe. <laughs> so it's that one area that's you know avoided on all those maps. Second, it's at that altitude that we can regenerate out from. So we really actually have the capacity to regenerate our watersheds here because we can get them from the source and then spread that out through Eastern you know, the US. So it's a great spot to kind of you know, hone in, regenerate our place and grow from. Um, also it being one of the most biodiverse, I feel like it's a great place to make sure we're maintaining that biodiversity and spreading out from here. So all these you know, considerations went into picking this project and its location with the community. So I think it just is perfect for, yeah. So really grateful, Robert, for you weaving this in. Seriously, it was perfect timing for me too. So Incredible. I'm happy you're blasting away there, man. Uh, just do your stuff. <laughs> um, any other thoughts, questions on anything um, before we end today that anyone would like to bring? Well, maybe what we'll do, because there's not very many of us, and I would love to just hear you, let's just do a one sentence or whatever you'd like to share, close out. If you just have a word, that's great too. We'll go around, we'll close out, and then when for today. Um, so Stephen, I'll send it to you. You can do that and then pass it to him, whoever you'd like. And if you don't want to go, just say skip. Hopeful, and I will pass it over to Walter. Uh I'd just like to mention that with uh, Nadim here, we're even in a two hour meeting this morning, um, I was realizing that uh, there was a lot more um, stuff could come together with the Vilcabamba community, the Inti coin and, and uh, Finca Sagrada. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how, um, uh, we we grow this whole regenerative uh, region. So we'll probably, I think in the next week or two, we'll have more to say as we work on it. So, uh, Robert. Yeah, energetic. That's my closing. And I'll pass it on to Nadine. Regeneration, and I pass it on to Anders. Hey, um, uh, curious. Um, I'm curious. I just realized that Lala Gardens went through, you know, a big, um, a big launch last Friday, and I don't know if anybody from Lala Gardens is on here. I'm curious how that went. Um, the launch was awesome. Um, I can share it and announce it. I'm not sure why they didn't, and I was wanting them to be here, but maybe since they've already done that announcement. So thank you for bringing that up. And yes, I'll share the announcements and stuff for in Discord. But yeah, they're they're doing well, um, and they could definitely probably benefit from you guys sharing that out to anyone who'd like to be part of that cooperative and what's happening there. Um, thanks, Anders. Sending it to or back to you or whoever you want to send it to. Cool, and I'm excited for all that we're doing. 
and uh, stoked to always be on these calls with you guys and ladies, everybody, all the spirits. Much love. And he went to Lauren. Okay, it's great to hear that uh, the fire hose paste that we were all trying to drink from is uh, is temporarily on pause, and we are we're, we're merging back with reality and the amount of time it takes to think through these epically huge, amazing <laughs> concepts. Uh, so I'm excited and uh, look forward to what's next. And let's see, Robert, have you gone yet? I'll pass it to Robert. Oh, you have? Yeah, I have, so. Oh, sorry. How about no, Charlie? Okay. Yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed hearing the future trajectory. I enjoyed the previous weeks as well, uh, hearing some of these big plans that everybody's got. So uh, being part of this is very exciting. Um, I think a way with dealing with the scale of this endeavor so far this year has been to pull together with other projects. So I've got a lot closer to traditional Dream Factory this year and spent some time there in June. And that um, partnering up uh, feels like a very good way of, of training together and sharing uh, learning and understanding. And in their case, they feel further ahead and feels more manageable as a project often, even though it's a big task that they're undertaking. Um, so that would be a feeling for the next steps of this is, is having these buddying processes because I found that very useful across this year, uh, being here with them uh, while still thinking about my project. Um, so I'm curious to see what the next steps are. Uh, and also just a, a shout out to the Gitcoin grants that are coming across the next couple of weeks. Because like you say, there's not a lot of money sloshing around in, in uh, the, the sphere at the moment. Um, it's probably not worth putting lots and lots of energy in. But um, I posted earlier on the Discord of just collecting together some uh, events across the next couple of weeks that maybe we can join, say something quickly and then disappear again or, or contribute to a wider conversation just to raise the awareness of um, Regen Civics and, and some of the land-based projects. So just uh, noting, noting that Gitcoin Grants closes on the 22nd, opens tomorrow. Uh, pass to someone else because I'm on the mo mobile phone so I can't see you or someone else hasn't spoken. Um, send it to Alexandra. Hi. Such an epic thing that you are having your, your hub in Asheville. I think it's a great place. I've been visiting Asheville for many years and you landed in a really good spot. So that's my remark. Thank you. And I'll pass it to you. Um, yeah. Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. I am feeling hopeful and inspired. I don't know who we have left. Um, <laughs> Brother, I um, all right. And wishing you tons of healing, Nico. All right. Very interesting. And God bless you all. Thank you, Ari. Um, and God bless you all. We are gods and we're blessing ourselves together. Um, so thank you for showing up to this. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I'm not sure George checked out. Did George check out? Um, that's his, he didn't actually join. That's just a thing. Oh, that, oh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, no, but that's everything. And we'll do another one of these sessions for the other half of projects that weren't able to make it to today. A lot of them are actually at TDF right in that book on Regen Villages right now. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, that's everything for today. I can't think of anything more and we can end a little bit early. How about that? So we can slow down the pace a little bit over these next you know, few months as we continue learning together. Um, so definitely turning off that fire hose. Feel free to go back and watch any of the other episodes if it's encouraging you because it still kind of lays out the plan anyway. Um, and that's definitely stuff we want to just keep you know, tinkering away at and working on. What is the game guide for people to contribute to our projects, right? Um, but the last thing that I guess is new here that I've been having a ton of fun with and I encourage is looking at it from that game lens. How can we create a game to help people understand how to play our game, right? So I think the more fun we can make it, I think the more dense of the information we can pack into it without it seeming tedious and overwhelming and, you know, all of these burnout symptoms that we get when we don't make it a game. 
Um, so I think that's been a tremendous, you know, unlock for me in the last few months. Like I've had it logically, you know, for many years, but I still was holding myself back because it's like, ugh, you know, if I don't take it too serious, we're never going to reach this audacious vision or whatever, like all these limiting beliefs that we put on ourselves. Um, but like just speaking from my own life unfolding here, just fully stepping into like, nope, like how do we make this as joyous and fun and, and spirited as possible? Because then people can feel more inspired and more enlivened and you know, Anders, you started off at this call so lovely that like those are the people that when we're creating with a group of co-created inspirers, like stuff that comes out of those creations is what we want it to be rather than, you know, wasting our time. Um, so I encourage as we go through our game guide, like make it, in, <laughs> make it a game as much as we can so it can be a joyful transition. Um, Anders, you got your hand up if you want to say something and then we'll close for today. No, it's not supposed to be up. Okay. <laughs> but, right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Rick. Yes. See you next time. Okay. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.